Hey students, hope you're doing well. Um, everybody survived the midterm. Um, I'll have those back to you in the next few days. Um, as you know, what we have today is my first lecture on Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. It's one of my absolute favorite readings. Um, and I think in significant part because there's so many layers to it. Um, it's not just a, a monster story, but it is that. Um, there are a lot of interesting things going on in it. I've tried to hint at some of those in the previous lectures that I gave, especially on Mary Wollstonecraft, her mother. Um, so I'll try to highlight those. Um, Mary Shelley had a very interesting life. Um, and again, with all of our authors, you, you can really learn a lot about um, what they chose to write about it, or write about things, um, how they chose to, to, to write, what their views were by looking at their personal lives. Um, and that is certainly the case here. And the circumstances under which the original story, uh, at least the kind of seed kernel for the story of Frankenstein came from is also, I think, pretty entertaining and pretty interesting. So we'll talk about that um, as well. So um, there's one particular picture of uh, Mary Shelley that um, I think is used for a lot of different purposes. It's on the cover of you know a bunch of different books about Mary Shelley, some editions of Frankenstein, and other things. Um, and this is that particular picture. So this is a, per a particular the picture that you will see. Um, it points again. Um, and what I want to do here um, is I'll put up a slide that that shows some of the background of of Mary Shelley, some of her biography, and then what I will do is. Um, talk about the things that are mentioned here, but I'm also going to go beyond that. But this is just a slide presents just kind of a brief, um, obviously, sort of bullet points of important aspects of her life. And I'll be, again, touching on these in a little more detail here in a minute. So um, born in 1797 in London. Um, mother died 10 days after giving birth to her. I've also seen it listed as 11 days in various places. So this is, again, Mary Wollstonecraft, her mother, um, who passed away when Mary Shelley was uh, only 10 or 11 days old, depending where you look. Uh, considered to be one of the first feminists, stating that women should not lower themselves to please their husbands or lovers. I think that to an extent that's true. Um, but many places that I've read suggest that, that Mary Shelley in some ways was actually at least a little more conservative than her mother was. And their mother, maybe Mary Wollstonecraft, was um, more of a feminist in certain ways than, than Mary Shelley was. So there's obviously some disagreement um, about that in the sort of uh, scholarly community. Um, her father, remember, was William Godwin, uh, a writer, political journalist, um, who had a revolutionary attitude towards social institutions, including things like marriage. Um, and um, so Mary Shelley obviously ended up living with her father um, exclusively after her mother passed away. And um, we'll talk a little bit about William Godwin, her father, again, what about you know what he was like. But again, she benefited just like her mother did from being in the company of the various writers, uh, political figures, uh, kind of movers and shakers of the day who um, knew William Godwin, right, through his uh, journal publication and um, would visit the house, um, et cetera. And she would get to meet these people. And there's a particularly interesting instance in where she meets um, Coleridge, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the author of Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner which is in many ways provides kind of a blueprint for Frankenstein. It's kind of telling the story from a, a little bit of a different perspective, but there are lots of really interesting and important parallels that I'll point out between Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, one of Coleridge's most famous poems along with Xanadu and a couple others. Um, and so I'll talk a little more about those um, parallels as well. Um, let's see what else I've got for us. I do have a picture of um, William Godwin that I'll show you. 
Um, he looks like he was relatively young when this picture was was taken, but again, this is her father and um, Mary Wollstonecraft's um, husband. And um, I'm actually going to keep him up there for a little bit. So, um, born in 1797, as I mentioned, uh, to a famous mother and a famous father, really as well, um, William Godwin. Um, and Mary, Mary Shelley, or as she was known before she was married to Percy Shelley, Mary Godwin, read her mother's memoirs and mother's books and really kind of cherished her, her memory. Um, and obviously that was going to be very important to her having never known, really known her mother. Her earliest years were supposedly fairly happy ones. Um, again, um, she got to meet some very interesting people. Um, and uh, her father had lots of, you know, fun contacts and, and that sort of thing. So especially for somebody who was going to grow up to be as intellectually curious as Mary Shelley, I think that was important. Um, she didn't receive a ton of formal education really early on, which is kind of interesting because you think her mother, Mary Wilsoncraft, would have wanted her to have, you know, a formal education and a formal education early on of the quality of that provided to males. Um, but her father did provide her with a tutor and he tutored her himself in all kinds of subjects. And obviously he was a very learned person. Um, he often took, um, took Mary on sort of educational outings. He had a very big library. Again, all these intellectuals influencing him, including, as I mentioned, uh, well, former vice president of the United States, Aaron Burr was one of them. And again, um, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the famous romantic poet, and I'll talk more specifically about that. Um, it was an advanced education, even though it was not the same kind of formal education her mother may have wanted because she was being exposed to great literature, philosophy, political ideas, and was um, allowed to discuss those things, debate those things, uh, which obviously many women were not allowed to do, uh, act and actively discouraged to do at the time. She did have a governess, again, a, a tutor, um, and um, was able to, you know, read books and eventually in Roman and Greek. Uh, she did attend a boarding school for a time, um, and was being just was described by her father as singularly bold, somewhat imperious. In other words, she uh, she had her own mind. She kind of do what wanted to do her own thing, and also an active mind. Her desire of knowledge is great, and her perseverance in everything she undertakes is almost invincible. Um, Certainly these are traits that she shared with her mother. So we know that, um, that Mary Shelley would eventually begin a relationship with Percy Shelley. And I will share a picture of Percy Shelley here. Um, it's sort of, of interesting. Um, a second here. Unfortunately, this, the picture turned that it turned out to not be exactly what I was hoping for. Uh, it has a quote from Percy Shelley here. I don't know if you can see it. it says, there is a harmony in autumn and a luster in its sky, which through the summer is not heard or seen as if it could not be as if it had not been. Um, we are now into the era of romanticism that I had kind of foreshadowed talking about Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, you can see Percy Shelley. Um, and this is true of a number of the pictures that I've seen of him or paintings I've seen of him, uh, looked almost feminine, very soft, you know, kind of, of features. Um, look, you know, looking very boyish, even as he got a little older, he still had those kind of boyish features. And um, Mary Godwin, as she was named at the time, uh, met Percy Shelley in an interval between um, her two of her stays in Scotland um, Percy Shelley had been become estranged from his wife and was regularly visiting William Godwin. And um, Shelley had money from his family and Godwin wasn't, wasn't doing very well financially. Um, you know, even though he had a name for himself as William Godwin and these people that came to visit him and I'm certainly sure his friends kind of helped him out you know, trying to write and publish this journal and other things he wanted to do. Um, he did struggle financially. And Percy Shelley shared some of his the same radical ideas, 
So he developed a friendship with Percy Shelley, who agreed to help bail him out of debt. Um, and that is where Mary Godwin ended up meeting Percy Shelley. Um, unfortunately, Shelley's family was very conservative. Percy Shelley's family was, um, and did not really like the radicalism of, of Percy Shelley. And because of that, a lot of his inheritance was really withheld from him for a long time. Um, they didn't give him a big allowance or anything like that. And even though he had promised to provide a money for William Godwin, um, he kind of couldn't follow through on that, at least for a long time, until um, you know his parents had, had passed away um, because they didn't like Percy's you know, politics. And that did create tension between Percy and William Godwin, and probably to an extent too, between Mary Godwin, or again, Pers uh, Mary Shelley, as she came to be known, and um, and her father, you know, perhaps as well. Um, but again, a very important figure um, in her life, um, increasingly becoming well known as a poet. And we'll talk a little bit about um, about his works and, and one in particular that's relevant to um, talking about Frankenstein. So Mary and Percy, because Percy was still married at the time, uh, started meeting secretly at Mary Wollstonecraft's grave in St. Pancras Churchyard, where they fell in love. Um, she at the time was nearly 17. He was nearly 22. You remember women started relationships and got married much younger, um, or at least significantly younger than, um, you know, then than they do today. Um, but I think this idea of, of them meeting secretly at her mother's uh, graveside kind of suggests to you that, that Mary Shelley didn't frighten easily, right? Um, and, and even maybe there's, you see the beginnings of this kind of Gothic um, awareness of the dark side and willing kind of, kind of to kind of dwell within the dark side. Um, maybe it made her feel closer to her mother um, when she was meeting Percy there, but it's not a place a lot of people would choose to have you know, um, secret meetings with a lover in, in a graveyard, much less by the grave of, of one of your parents. Um, so um, her father did approve of the relationship at first because Percy was married at the time and, um, you know, he became aware of it and, and these things, no doubt, other people become aware of them as well. You can't hide a relationship like this. So I'm sure that, that, um, that Percy Shelley's wife was aware of this. Um, and, um, but she did, Mary Godwin, did she, Percy as embodying her parents' liberal and reformist ideas, and that was obviously attracted to her. Um, and um, so there was a strange set of relationships going on here um, between Mary Godwin and her father and Percy Shelley, Percy Shelley and his first wife, um, as she came to be eventually. Um, and um, the children that he had with his first wife, uh, including a, a stepsister named Claire Claremont, who um, Mary didn't get along with at all. They probably kind of competed maybe for attention from, from Percy. Um, and when actually when Percy left um, his wife for, um, for Mary Shelley, she was pregnant at the time, right? So the timing there is not great either. Uh, but they did travel. Or they were allowed to you know, be away and uh, seen by other people in this kind of secret relationship they were trying to have and did a lot of traveling and did a lot of reading together, which I think probably was ultimately important for both of them um, as they um, developed as, as thinkers, um, eventually as writers, um, you know, could share ideas because they were reading and talking about the same kinds of things. Um, etc. Um, Percy actually showed some amount of joy when his um, when this this um, child uh, who his wife was pregnant with um, when um, that child was eventually born uh, named Harriet Shelley um, and that was difficult for well, for her again, also with Claire Claremont being in the picture. And so um, again, things were, um, you know, things were sort of uncomfortable as far as that goes. Um, Mary um, did lose a child 
which was an important event in her life. Um, as, it, as it says here in the document, I'm, I'm um, referring to that it, it, it incurred a kind of acute depression and in Mary Godwin um, to lose this child. And she right, also talked about being haunted about visions of the baby. Um, and even um, a little foreshadowing here in her life, um, dreamt of the cold corpse of the baby coming back to life. Right. And of course, we had this parallel with Frankenstein's monster being made up of, of body parts of dead human beings and the idea of animating this um, tissue that was once animate, but had become inanimate with the death of the people that the tissue came from. Um, and so, again, another thing that in her personal life that we can see relates to her famous story of Frankenstein. Um, Frankenstein um, was published in 1818. It was published anonymously and reviewers and readers actually assumed that Percy must have been the person who wrote Frankenstein. Mary Shelley, you know, was, was not known as a writer, probably at least in many um, um, in the, the broader public. And it was so well written um, that people assumed that Percy Shelley had written it and maybe in honor of William Godwin or something like that. Um, the second edition then comes out with Mary Shelley as the author and people were really surprised. Um, and there's kind of, I get one of these back, backhanded compliments. Somebody actually claimed in a review of Frankenstein that, that it was a great work to have come from a male, but to have come from a female was absolutely extraordinary. Um, so I get one of those backhanded compliments. Um, and she was actually, um, I think, 19 at the time. Um, and that's also, I think, pretty interesting to show how developed she was intellectually and as a writer, as a storyteller, uh, and all the symbolism and, and allusions to again, philosophy and politics and different things in Frankenstein, that she was able to bring all of that together in the brilliant way that she did in Frankenstein, I think is, is um, is really you know kind of worth recognizing. Um, Percy unfortunately did die. Um, he had a sailboat and he had friends that he often went sailing with. Um, one of his friends um, actually was Lord Byron, who we'll talk a little more about, but other people that he knew, they went for a, a sail one day when, when he was visiting some of these friends and Mary wasn't there. Um, and um, she gets a letter in the mail that says that that Percy and his friends left uh, a while ago, and that um, the people that were were still there um, were worried because there was a storm that came up not long after. And in the letter, they say they hoped he arrived safely and that he should have arrived by then. Well, he wasn't there, unfortunately. And so Mary, you know, kind of starts to realize that something must have gone wrong because this letter, you know, um, it took what letter took a while to get there and says that, well, he should be there by now. He wasn't. Um, they did eventually find his body um, kind of um, drift washing up on shore uh, in Veragio. This is in Italy where they spent a lot of time. And, um, and there would been, this was 10 days after the storm. And so here she loses her husband as well. Uh, she really wanted to be able to support her child. I think this, again, re represents, reflects her mother, Mary Wilsoncraft, saying that women who are single, who decide to remain single, who lose their husbands because they perish or because they're abusive and they break away from those relationships, should be able to be independent, should be able to make their way themselves <coughs> financially, et cetera. And so that's exactly what Mary Shelley resolved to do after Percy Shelley died. And she was able to do so. Um, her financial situ situation at times was precarious, but she and her son were able to survive. She did translations and writings and those kind of things. Uh, stayed with her father and her stepmother, um, who again remarried. Um, again, that's that's that difficult relationship uh, that Mary has um, with her stepmother, and it's inevitably probably going to happen because her mother's really famous. She's thinking her mother can never be replaced. Uh, she never got to know her mother, but she read a lot of her work. You can see how no woman that that um, 
that William Godwin would ever remarry would measure up to her, um, even more so because um, she didn't know her mother. She knew she was this great person. She read her diaries, et cetera. She probably didn't know of firsthand her flaws, if they would have had any personality conflicts, you know, whatever. So, so I think Mary Wollstonecraft becomes almost larger than life to her daughter. And that makes it difficult uh, in her relationship with her stepmother. Um, she was, um, she did make relationships and have relationships with other people um, after that point, though she never remarried. Um, American writer John Howard Payne, and then also uh, Washington Irving, uh, intrigued her. Uh, Payne fell in love with her and in 1826 asked her to marry him. And she refused, saying that after being married to one genius, she could only marry another, which is a big ouch to, um, to Payne. Obviously, she's saying, well, I can only really marry geniuses and you're not a genius like, like Percy was. So, you know, she's not going to marry him. Um, again, she did stay busy as a writer and editor. Um, after Percy died, wrote some other novels, wrote in an encyclopedia. Encyclopedias, again, were becoming very popular at the time and sort of coming out of the Enlightenment era as we move into the 18th century to um, make widely available more to the general public, all the great experiments, all the great new ideas that were being developed, the new thinkers. Uh, everything kind of growing out of the enlightenment and the expansion of the intellect. And so a way of, of, of sharing that knowledge with the general public, which I think was really important, right? The libraries would eventually do that, I think, as well. Um, unfortunately, Mary Shelley's last years, um, she was very ill from 1839. She suffered from headaches and bouts of paralysis. Um, and that limited her time and her ability you know, to do as much reading and writing as she would have liked to have do. On the first anniversary of her death, the Shelley family opened her box desk. Inside they found locks of her children's hair. It was common for people to keep locks of their children's hair, it still is fairly common. A notebook she had shared with Percy Shelley, probably when they were traveling together, and a copy of his poem, Adonis, with one page folded round a silk parcel containing some of his ashes and the remains of his heart. Again, we get this kind of gothic, you know, dark, romantic, sort of very passionate, um, but almost disturbed kind of thing going on here with her shaving the remains of his heart. I'm sure some other people at the time did that, but again, a little bit creepy maybe, um, but, um, Again, reflective of the kind of personality that, that, that Mary would develop. And um, again, maybe helpful for us understanding why she would have written a story you know, like Frankenstein. So I want to get into a little more depth talking about the, the situation under which, um, in which the, the, in the seed kernel of Frankenstein kind of came about. I think it's pretty interesting. Um, I had mentioned that Percy Shelley was friends with Lord Byron. And share his picture here. Um, they spent some time one summer with Lord Byron in Geneva, uh, where he had uh, a villa. I'm sure we would think it was, when we think of villa, we might think of something very small. I'm sure it was very large and impressive. Right, uh, Lord Byron, also a very famous poet of the era. And um, Percy and Mary went with a number of other friends of Byron's to stay that summer with them, this lake in Geneva. Note that that is also the setting for Frankenstein. That's where Frankenstein is from. That's where Victor Frankenstein is from, is from Geneva. And there are some other scenes from the book that we'll be reading about where he will return to Geneva, where he returned to Lake Geneva in particular, the mountains around Geneva, they become very important. Um, again, there's this whole theme of romanticism that uh, we'll talk about in the book. And, um, but it was very rainy this summer and they were indoors a lot of times. So they did a lot of reading and um, they came up with this idea of writing ghost stories. Um, and you can imagine in this, you know, this big dark old house, um, and this dreary you know, summer where there's a lot of rain and everything, how uh, that may have been sort of a fun idea for them. 
And so that's indeed what they decided to do. And so we get to um, sort of the origins of the Frankenstein story here. And let me share with you a slide that gives a little bit of that, that information. Uh, written the age of 18. I think that maybe the, 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 again, the seed kernel was written. She was in 18. I think maybe she was 19 by the time it was published. Um, originally, it was just kind of a short story version of it that was written when, when they decided to tell ghost stories in Geneva. Um, later on, it was expanded you know, into the novel that we're now reading. Um, again, 1826, spending time in Geneva, Switzerland with Lord Byron and Percy and some other people including a guy um, named uh, William Polidori, who we'll talk about just a little bit. Um, again, this, these fierce storms and the rain, telling ghost stories together. Mary Shelley at first really could not could think of anything to write about. She had writer's block at first, but she had a dream that was again, like this dream of her, her uh, child coming to life but in this particular dream was even a little more specific as she, as it says here in the dream, she sees, as she said, a student of the unhallowed arts kneeling beside a hideous corpse and with help of a powerful machine, bringing the horrible creature to life. What an imagination she had. And again, it's almost like a, a reconstruction events from her actual life that she experienced. And the idea of unhallowed arts, that, that means here that you're playing God, that you're doing things that go against nature, right? And that's what, what um, this, this pseudoscience called alchemy was all about, that Victor became really interested in, right? Um, alchemy had to do with turning uh, different um, non-precious metals into gold and other kinds of things, changing the, the physics of something, changing its natural state. And so you can imagine that animating dead tissue and bringing it back to life would be considered one of those unhallowed arts. Again, a playing God, certainly from a, um, a, the, the tradition of any traditional religion, uh, something you're not supposed to be doing, right? Um, so she begins feverishly writing this ghost story when she gets this particular inspiration. Again, it's latest pub later published one year later when she was 19. Um, so again, the circumstances of the, of the story are really interesting here. Um, I mentioned William Polidori, who was also there. Not only did the very famous story Frankenstein originate from that summer on Lake Geneva at Lord Byron's um, home, Polidori also wrote the seed kernel of um, what becomes the story of Dracula. Um, it, it was actually based on this as well. So sort of interesting, two of the greatest kind of gothic tales, horror stories of all time, originating from the same um, place, the same time. And these folks deciding that they were going to write ghost stories and have kind of a contest to see who could write the best ghost story. And we get the seed kernel of Frankenstein and uh, Dracula kind of coming out of um, this, um, um, the same activity with these same people. Um, I'm going to show you here uh, before we get into um, some more specifics about the story and about the Gothic uh, sort of um, philosophy. And, and it was um, it was a cultural phenomenon too. Um, yes, people wrote about the Gothic, but it was sort of an, outsh an outshoot of romanticism, almost the dark side of Romanticism. Romanticism focused on nature. The Gothic focused on sort of the dark side of, of nature or the power of nature and the way it could overwhelm human beings. And again, I'll get into that a little more. But here are two um, and uh, views of, of maybe what Frankenstein looked like, people's own renderings after reading the story. I know you've seen the one from the movie and from the monsters of this monster with the big kind of a flat head on top and and very square shoulders and the, the nodes on the neck, the electric nodes, maybe where the electricity was injected into the flesh to bring it to life. So I chose two that are slightly different from, from those two because I think you probably have seen those before. So here's one sort of version of this Frankenstein. Um, 
This one maybe not being quite as grotesque as other versions, but you can see where the flesh was sewn together. Uh, we know that Frankenstein is described as, as this superhuman in size and very intimidating because that. Um, you don't quite get that, that sense of the terror of this person in this particular vision. It's, it's a little less monster-like. It's, it's, and I think that's, that's useful. It brings out more of the human side because again, Frankenstein was made from human tissue. He was a kind of human being, but remember he's born with a human body, human level of maturity, and you know, intellectual development, physical skill, but uh, the experience of a child, right? This goes back to uh, John Locke's discussion of how we learn and grow, right? We have sense data we take in from our various senses. We piece that together to make simple ideas. We piece simple ideas to, to create more complex ideas. Along with that, romanticism got really interested in child development. You can see it in a lot of romantic poetry and the writing of, in particular, um, Wordsworth. Um, I think his writing really shows an appreciation for child development. Eventually, the science of child development will come about. Those of you who are interested in education, maybe in the School of Education, um, you know, are aware of or will become aware of some of those things. Um, he does look very large in this picture, but he's, he's not quite as maybe as grotesque as, as some pictures you might see. Um, Frankenstein tells us in the story, as he's speaking to this boat captain, Robert Walton, that um, this, this, this monster, as he, as he describes it, or this daemon, uh, D-A-E-M-O-N, um, who at least in from the Christian tradition is kind of described as half human and, and half God, an, an aberration in some sense. Um, but often this, this idea that, that, that it has supernatural powers or it's in touch with some kind of dark side of supernaturalism or something like that is suggested by this word daemon. Um, that's the way that, that, um, that Frankenstein often refers to the monster. Remember that the monster was not called Frankenstein. A lot of popular culture, when people think of Frankenstein or portray Frankenstein, they portray the monster. Victor Frankenstein was a scientist who made the monster or the daemon. So just sort of remember that. But he says that it's, he's really big because um, to sew together this tissue, it was easier to work with large human parts than small human parts. Now, ultimately that doesn't make sense, right? Veins and capillaries are still the same size and you've got to sew those together um, in some sense and, and parts of the brain and everything else. And of course we realize it's absolutely impossible to do this, um, but I guess he believes it's somewhat more realistic to, to say that you can do this because you're working with these larger body parts rather than small body parts. Uh, you'll find that more or less compelling as a reason. Um, and then there's another uh, sort of a version here of um, Frankenstein's monster, another portrayal of what he might've looked like. I kind of like this one in particular. Um, you see there holding in his hand, Looks like it has an F on the front. I believe that's supposed to be Frankenstein's diary. Remember, he was writing this diary during the time that he was trying to create the monster and um, the monster got a hold of it and reads what Frankenstein's thoughts were while he was creating the monster and of um, the way he was playing God and what his motivations were and the way that he was almost um, unable to control himself. He was, he was sort of driven to do this. There's a major theme in the book of this idea of fate and whether or not people, in particular Victor Frankenstein, takes responsibility for what he did or whether he thinks that it was just fate that he's going to create this horrible monster and, you know, et cetera. Um, so look out for that theme. Look for, for places where Victor takes responsibility for what he did and places where he pushes against that and says, well, it was all fate. It was out of my hands, it was out of my control. There are some parallels in that same um, theme in um, the experience of the sea captain that we'll talk about, and also in Cole Richard Ryman, The Ancient Mariner, which again, Frankenstein is in many ways based on. Um, we do have sort of this, this he's being you know, sewn across the top, a little flatter head here where you plunk the brain in. Um, We've got the, the, the nodes here again, where the electricity was attached. This almost looks like, if any of you know the, the heavy metal band that actually I think still exists. They're, 
they're, they're old at this point, named Iron Maiden, but the, they, their um, uh, character uh, who's on all their albums named Eddie is, is almost looks like a Frankenstein's monster sort of, of character. Um, okay, so those are the kind of the visions of, um, of Frankenstein's monster. So the Gothic aspect to the story. So, um, so we have romanticism kind of growing out of the enlightenment, whereas the enlightenment focused a lot on science and reason and on intellect, on analysis of things as science does. Um, and very much a view of analysis that suggests that the best way to understand something is to break it down into its component parts. So we have Locke talking about sense data. We have other scientists and people like Newton trying to, you know, looking at, uh, eventually looking at atoms and, and particles and all that kind of thing. I highlight that because it's very different from, from Eastern culture, which focuses a lot more on a holistic perspective and says, suggests that that's the best way to understand things is, is more from this more holistic perspective. So that's an interesting contrast. If, if you read any work from what might be called Eastern humanities to see that sort of difference um, in ideas about enlightenment and in knowledge, et cetera. Um, so romanticism grows out of the enlightenment and, and emphasizes more the um, affective side, the emotional side of who we are as human beings. And I had mentioned that Mary Wollstonecraft started to recognize and accept that side of humanity. So she started still needed to be controlled by our rational side. But romanticism pushed back against that and almost says that the that the emotional side, the affective side of us is actually a better guide to our, our behavior. And again, this idea that, that everybody is born moral and that society that corrupts people, right? That idea comes from a lot from, from, um, from Jean-Jacques Rousseau and his work, Emile. And that um, we're born with this inner compass, this natural moral sentiment, these in moral intuitions that are moral guides for us. And we need to follow those and not follow the corruption of society. So that becomes a major theme in Romanticism. And there are other themes of Romanticism we'll be returning to um, as well. The Gothic is kind of an offshoot of Romanticism that focuses again on the dark side of nature. The Goths were uh, Germanic tribes. Um, you might remember, I'm looking back in history. And the Gothic, um, offshoot of romanticism really focused on nature in terms of its mysteriousness, the fact that it's really all powerful. Um, you see a lot of symbolism in Gothic literature uh, that ties human experience and human nature together with nature itself. Um, you'll notice, for example, that every time the monster is about to appear at nighttime, the moon looks yellow. Yellow often signifies death and, and sickness and, and evil. So there's, and there's a lot of animism, um, inanimate things taking on the, the um, properties of, of animate beings, in particular of human beings, of personification, um, nature personifying human experience, human emotion, human belief. You'll see all of that in the symbolism in Frankenstein. And it's often been described as sort of a, combining romanticism with, with horror, right? Um, a pleasing sort of terror and extreme emotion it's been sort of linked to. So think about all this in Mary Shelley's life and you know, seeing her dead um, child and then seeing this, um, this scientist uh, who becomes Victor Frankenstein creating this monster using the unhallowed arts and, and all of that meeting with her at the time, secret lover, Percy Shelley in the uh, grave um, yard and by the gravestone of her mother, right? All these kinds of dark, you know, sorts of things. Um, all kind of betoken uh, a, a Gothic sort of, of um, mindset uh, um, that, that her mind would often go kind of the, to the dark side. And that, that also, so she was drawn to it. Again, a pleasing sort of terror, right? It's like people who are really grown, drawn to horror stories, right? They enjoy horror stories. It's really dark, it's nasty, it's ugly in a sense, but 
it's a pleasing sort of horror, a pleasing sort of terror at the same time. So you get that here. Um, I should also mention that um, in the book, you'll see a number of references to natural philosophy. Natural philosophy refers to what today we think of as the physical sciences. As empirical science develops, um, natural philosophy was more speculative. It was not as experimental. As that starts to develop out of the enlightenment and things get more um, codified, you have the scientific method develop, then the physical sciences kind of emerge as a, a version of empiricism. Um, and so, you know, you see physics and, and biology and chemistry, all of those things um, in terms of the physical sciences. And then again, the social sciences grow out of those. We'll talk about that a little later in the semester. Uh, so when you see references to natural philosophy, that's kind of what's being referred to. Um, so the setting of the story is interesting and it's a little confusing at the very beginning. It's set aboard a ship, right? And what we're actually reading at the beginning of the story are letters that the sea captain Robert Walton is sending home to his sister. Right, and he finds himself in St. Petersburg in Russia. And he's got this great desire to um, find a ship and hire a crew because he wants to sail to the North Pole. He imagines it at this very romantic place. He's drawn to it, almost like, you know, um, like the force of magnetism. And he even talks about discovering when he gets to the North Pole, finding out what that secret source of magnetism is all about. Um, and in fact, many Gothic stories or stories that have a Gothic element to them take place on the ocean or on the sea in one way or another, on the water. Um, so I just, I jotted down some examples to mention here. Uh, there's Shakespeare's Tempest, um, which we read in Hum 1. Uh, Herman Melville's book, Moby Dick has that element to it and the way in which you know, the uh, um, Captain Ahab is 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 um, sort of out of his mind, um, so drawn to and obsessed with killing this whale, Moby Dick. Uh, Captain's Courageous, that's from Rudyard Kipling. There's The Heart of Darkness from Joseph Conrad. Sea Wolf from Jack London. Uh, Homer's Odyssey, which became a blueprint for a lot of stories that came after it. Um, Another Gothic story that, that um, has this element too is called Earl King or Earl Conning by Goethe, one of the great romantic poets. And in that story, there is a child on a horse. Um, his, he's sitting behind his father on this horse and they're trying to escape this, e this evil king of the alders, of the alder grove. Alders are kind of a tree. And there's, there's kind of water that's ahead of them looming in the distance. So there's even water in that side of, in that story. So I think, um, you know, gives us a sense for the story being set on the water. Again, because we're drawn to the water, right? Like electricity, the water both um, can serve human beings, right? You can harness the power of electricity and the power of water to serve human beings. You need water to survive but it can also overwhelm you and kill you. You can drown in the water, right? Um, you can um, get caught up in the tide. Uh, think about Percy Shelley dying uh, on, on, when he sailboat with his friends in this storm, right? Um, so, um, you know, you know th there are other examples, you know, as well, tidal waves, you know, et cetera. So, um, and that's a Gothic theme too, right? That these things that, that he draw, human beings are drawn to, that they might need them, uh, the power of nature that they can harness, but also that it can, uh, because nature is overpowering and can't be totally controlled, it can also, again, take your life, which is why Victor should not be playing around with trying to you know, animate dead matter. Um, so, um, you'll notice that the subtitle of Frankenstein is or a modern Prometheus. Uh, some of you might remember who Prometheus was from mythology, Greek mythology. 
the original story may have come from, from Aeschylus, but there are other sort of versions of this tale. And I'll share a picture here, Prometheus. You remember Prometheus was this character, he was one of the Titans and he stole fire from the gods and gave it to immortal human beings, which he shouldn't have done. Only the gods should have the power, you know, the ability to be able to harness nature. And so pun for punishment for that, Zeus has him bound to a rock and he's, his uh, liver is eaten out every day by an eagle. Overnight it grows and then it's eaten out a day. So it's this endless torture, almost like Dante's Inferno that he's kind of experiencing here. And you can see these kind of claw marks on him. Um, and some portray him as having this big scar on his side where his liver is. Um, so like Prometheus, Victor was also doing something that angered the gods. He was also trying to harness the power of the gods. Prometheus was the power of fire. For Victor, it's the ability to create life um, out of nothingness or out of at least out of dead tissue. Um, so that's why we have this subtitle, uh, Modern Prometheus. Um, it's also interesting to note that there is a, um, actually there are a number of other stories that were based on the story of Prometheus, but one of them comes from Mary Shelley's husband, Percy Shelley, in one of his most famous poems called Prometheus Unbound. When Prometheus is saved, he's unchained from the rock, there's that same Prometheus character here we can see chained to the rock. Um, it almost looks like there's a maybe the, the eagle is dead by his side here. And somebody's coming to save him um, and um, from the rock. And you can see that there is that um, that red scarring on his side from where his, you know, his his liver was eaten out every day from this eagle. Um, so that may have also been. Again, Mary Shelley was obviously new of this story. She knew her husband's poetry. Uh, I'm sure they read it together and he read it for her as he was composing it, right? We have all these interesting aspects of it tied to that. Um, so again, um, the subtitle or a modern Prometheus from the story of Frankenstein. Um, I also uh, mentioned to you the Reminiscent Mariner theme. And the fact that um, Roman Ancient Mariner has more than any other single piece of literature, all kinds of parallels in uh, Frankenstein and that people have written um, you know, major pieces of scholarship on the way in which Frankenstein is a kind of a rewriting of the story of Roman Ancient Mariner. And it is for a number of reasons. One of them is that the sea captain, Robert Walton, uh, who we meet at the beginning of the story. Again, he's obsessed to reach the North Pole, even though it's described as a place that's just ice and freezing cold and the dark side of nature. He believes that there is this a light side to it. He's drawn to it. He believes it's a beautiful place that um, where he can actually maybe live or stay, but we know he hasn't thought through this really carefully. He's just so obsessed <clears throat> um, with um, making his way to the North Pole. But he's endangering his life and he's endangering the life of his crew. Um, there are references to um, indirect references to Roman Ancient Mariner by Walton when he talks to his sister in these letters about dream drawn to the North Pole. Then there are actually direct citations of Roman the Ancient Mariner there. And so I just wanted to share um, briefly um, sort of a part of the, the story there. A uh, segment of Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Um, because again, it be becomes this important theme. So um, there's in, in Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, written by Coleridge, there are um, in italics a kind of summary statements about what's happening in the story, and then there's the actual poetic elements themselves. Um, so I should tell you that when Mary Shelley, Shelley was young, uh, Coleridge came to visit her father, William Godwin. He had just written his first draft, I believe it was, of Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And she's supposed to have gone up to bed, it's past her bedtime, but she hides behind the sofa in her father's study and hears Coleridge recite the story of Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And we know she's already got this kind of fascination with the dark side, as did a lot of 
romantic authors and uh, did as well. And also she's hearing the, the, the author himself read the poem. Nobody could read the poem more compellingly, no doubt, than uh, Coleridge could himself. So she actually heard the poem read when she was young and obviously that stayed with her. So here's part of the story. The ship drives driven by a storm plays toward the South Pole. Um, so this, this sea captain in Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner is um, originally um, kind of heading south in the story um, below the equator. And first he deals with the heat and, and, and the sun and no nutri nutrition, no nourishment. And all there is is salt water, which you can't drink, right? And then um, the, 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 the storm drives the ship even farther to the South Pole, where the region again is, is, is kind of like it is with the North Pole, right? It's all ice and cold and et cetera. So um, as the description says, the, sh the ship by a storm is driven towards the South Pole. And now the storm blast came and he was tyrannous and strong. He struck with his overtaking wings and chased us south along. So notice now that the things are out of control of the sea captain and his crew. The storm has taken over. With sloping mass and dipping prow, as who pursued with yell and blow, she treads the shadow of his foe and forward bends his head. The ship drove fast, loud roared the blast. The southward eye we fled. And now there came both mist and snow and nuclear wondrous cold. The ice mast high came floating by as green as emerald, right? So the same thing that, that Robert Walden's experiencing after he has the ship and crew as he's traveling farther and farther towards the North Pole. The land of ice and the fearful sounds where no living thing was to be seen. Counter to what um, Robert Walton sees, which is, um, as they become locked into the ice, they see the um, the sled dog and do and and sled and this what looks like a, a oversized human being in the distance with the sled of dogs. And then I think it was just a couple of days later, they stumble upon um, a, a piece of ice with Victor on it. And interestingly, he asks them where they're going before he'll get in the boat. And they're thinking this guy looks half starved. He's He's, he's close to death. And he's saying that he's only going to get in this boat if we're and uh, going to be keep traveling north. And um, we know that because he's, he's he was trying to catch the, the monster, right? He's trying to reach him. Uh, so he wants he's happy to find out strangely, because obviously it's it's not very wise that they want to keep heading north towards the North Pole and that therefore um, he can keep um, in his quest to. Um, to find the monster, um, to obtain him, which um, takes up um, a decent portion of the second half of the story. So even though in, in the Ancient Mariner, there's nothing living there, ironically, there's something living there for Robert Walton, Victor, and it's the monster. And through the drifts, the snowy cliffs did stand a dismal sheen, nor shapes of men, nor beasts we can, the ice was all between. And here was one of the, the famous lines. The ice was here, the ice was there, the ice was all around. It cracked and growled and roared and howled like noises in a sound. So this is when they're in the, you know, um, in the ice and the snow um, and can't move forward. Um, early in the story when they're north towards the equator, uh, it's hot, the sun's beating down. That's when um, the famous line, water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink comes from Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, it comes from that place in the story. Now, mysteriously, it's not explained why the sea captain is heading towards the south, you know, the south the way he is, why he wants to sail below the equator. There's no real reason for him to be doing so. And so it's almost like he's, he's driven himself, though Coleridge doesn't tell us why, why he's doing something that seems to be strange. But once he gets to a certain point, things are out of his control. So you get this idea, again, that he believes it was just fate, that the fates, the gods are taking over, the storm's taking over, nature's taking over, and it's all out of his hands at this point. What eventually happens are that he um, asks for forgiveness, and this the the, the crew comes to life temporarily, and uh, this is after he had killed the albatross, which had been trying to save the ship, and 
the albatross also represents nature, which he doesn't trust apparently. And so he kills the albatross. But um, the, the wind occurrence helped to, um, and, and there's a sense of this kind of supernatural force animates his crew and they go back and uh, are saved. They go back to the port and are saved. And as punishment, the sea captain has for the rest of his life to retell his story to other people so that they can learn from his story. So there's a confessee confessor relationship there. The sea captain is the confessor. The confessee is, as Coleridge describes him, a wedding guest. Um, the uh, sea captain finds himself uh, seeing a wedding that's going on outdoors, and he's drawn to tell this wedding guest about his story um, because um, somehow he just he, he knows somehow that this person needs to hear his story, right? Um, and so again, we get this you know uh, real central elements of Raymond the Ancient Mariner going on here. And what we eventually discover is that same relationship between confessor and confessee, between Victor and this Robert Walden, the sea captain. Shelley tells us a lot to suggest that Robert Walton will be the perfect confessee for Victor because they're very similar. They are playing God. They are endangering human life, their own life and the life of other people, right? The sea captain's endangering the life of his crew, just like in Ryan the Ancient Mariner, the sea captain was endangering the life of his crew to do something he shouldn't be doing. Victor was endangering other people's lives by creating this monster without thinking about the consequences. And this monster right, might run amok and just kill people mindlessly. Um, we know that the uh, Robert Walden, the sea captain from Frankenstein, wanted a friend. He felt like he needed somebody that could also appreciate this obsession that he had. And he didn't have anybody like that in his life. And um, that um, he had just these big ideas that wanted to do sort of big things. And so there are a number of parallels that lead us to believe that, the, that Robert Walton will at least listen to Victor's story. He won't listen to it and try to kill him or listen to it and throw him overboard or say, you know, hey, this is a crazy story you're telling me. I'm not going to waste my time. He's drawn into it. And notice how once the story really gets underway and Robert Walton ends up writing the story down to send home to his sister to say, you won't believe this, what happened to me, that I met this guy and I saved him and he told me this story. Um, and what we're basically reading when we're reading the story of Frankenstein is what Robert Walton wrote down as Victor told him basically what happened to him in creating this monster, et cetera. Um, so that's kind of you know, the way the story begins, right? Robert Walton, um, Shelley wants us to know that he's very, very much like this, this Victor Frankenstein character he's gonna, she's gonna tell us about. Um, and they're very similar in a lot of ways that suggest again that he will um, listen to the story that Frankenstein is going to tell him about creating this monster. Um, so and we also learn about other things in the story early on about um, kind of person that Victor is that he would even think about creating this monster, right? Um, and that makes sense because Victor wants Robert Walton to know how he came to create the monster. Um, and um, gradually tell him the story. But he still knows at any minute that Robert Walton might start to say, hey, you're just making this up. But Robert Walton has enough of his imagination, right? He's a, he has enough of the sense of the beyond and the supernatural and whatever because of his own quest to reach the North Pole and seeing it as this romantic kind of beautiful place that, um, that he follows along with Victor and is willing to believe his story and write it down as he does. Um, they're both very curious, right? Um, there was the in episode where they were visiting a friend. Victor wandered into the friend's library and found a book uh, by this guy named Cornelius Agrippa on alchemy. 
and uh, ended up reading it and becoming interested in alchemy. He wants to read other books and he tells his father and his father says, why do you want to read that sad trash? Uh, we have real science today. This alchemy is just garbage. It's not real science. You're wasting your time. And instead of redirecting him and saying, why don't you read this other stuff? And said, he kind of uh, ridicules uh, Victor and um, you know, tells him he's a fool and an idiot and the al alchemy is a waste of time. This is one of the things I think that leads Victor later to say that, um, that it was fate that led him to do what he did. Things happened in his life that made it inevitable that he was going to do what he did. Just as the, the sea captain, Robert Walden, suggests the same things about why he's driven to try to go to the North Pole with this ship and crew. Uh, Victor also tells us about his mother dying and that he didn't fear death much. Um, and we're seeing these parallels too in Mary Shelley's own life and her relationship with death. Um, when he goes away to college, away to the university in Ingolstadt, uh, his close friend, Henry Clairville does not go with him. And we know that Henry Clairville was interested in stories of knights in armor and chivalry um, and adventure. And he, but he has this kind of real interested in, in the morality or immorality of human behavior. And it's almost as though when Victor's away from Clairville, um, because Clairville's father won't let him also go to this university in Ingolstadt with him, um, that somehow Victor lost his way morally. And it suggested that maybe if Clairville was there, he wouldn't have. It's also suggested that maybe if his sister uh, was there, Sister Elizabeth was there, he also would not have done what he did. But notice how he really isolates himself as he's creating the monster, right? He doesn't think people will believe what he's doing, that they'll tell him he should stop what he's doing. Uh, you know, he shouldn't be doing it. He shouldn't be playing God. And then there's another part of him that says that I'm only gonna tell people about it once I've actually accomplished it and, and showing them, hey, yeah, that I can do this, right? So he's isolated himself and he's lost his moral compass. He's become obsessed with creating this monster. Now, at first he says he wanted it to do good, right? Maybe he, what he learns can help and cure ill people or um, replace organs or, you know, some of the things actually we can do today, in fact, which is interesting. Um, but um, he also, I think, I think it's also being suggested to us that if Henry Clairville was with him the whole time, he wouldn't have done what he did. And we'll see Henry Clairville ends up coming to Ingolstadt later. And then he sees a tree hit by electricity and totally destroyed. That again, reflects the fact that nature, that electricity is a form of nature and lightning can create and or destroy, right? The electricity can animate a dead matter potentially and it can also destroy and it's extremely powerful. So all these things kind of, um, when Victor tells a story to Robert Walton and as we read about them, help us to help to explain why Victor becomes so obsessed to do what he wants to do and why Walton is willing to hear him out. Um, now, the last thing I'm, I'm gonna mention here um, in this introductory lecture, he goes to Ingolstadt, he meets two university professors, right? So it's kind of like, who's gonna be his advisor here? And he meets this M. Waldman and he meets M. Kremp also. He meets Kremp first and Kremp basically does the same thing his father does. Why are you reading alchemy? You're, you're wasting your mind. You should have prepared for the university by reading real science. Um, and just kind of um, tells him he's an idiot basically. And he's wasting his time and et cetera. But he's taking this guy's classes because you know he, he needs to learn about biology and chemistry and more updated kind of science than alchemy. And um, at one point, Krem can't teach the classes. So this other professor named M. Waldman comes on the scene. And um, he also meets with, um, he, he teaches the class and teaches it very differently um, in a way that seems like much more respectfully. He seems to have this romantic side to him. He seems to be drawn to science because of that romantic side. What can science ultimately do Right, this power that we're developing. And so um, he meets with this M. Waldman and Med Waldman also tells him, yeah, that, you know, this, this alchemy is outdated, but he can appreciate the fact that, that um, Victor is really drawn to this idea of the power of science. What can science ultimately achieve, right? What, what's the big picture? He doesn't want to get caught up in, in atoms and 
molecules and and you know these these tiny particles of nature. Um, he wants the big picture. You know, what can we do with if we can harness the power of science? And Maldwin appreciates that side of, of of Victor, right? And and again, kind of nurtures it. And it's been said that that the M. Waldman character, as he's described as a person, um, both his character and what he looked like physically, was a lot like Mary Shelley's father, William Godwin. There's a couple other characters here who it looks like maybe have been patterned after people that Mary Shelley knew. But it's been suggested that that um, M. Waldman is described very much like um, Mary's father, Mary Wollstonecroft's husband, uh, William Godwin. So that's my introductory lecture. I hope you found that background information interesting. I hope you enjoy the story. Um, it's one of the ones, again, that I reread every time I teach Frankenstein because I think it's so fascinating. Again, so many layers to it. Um, so I hope you found this lecture helpful and interesting. And um, as always, let me know if you have any questions about anything. Just send me an email and I'll see you next time.